been a lot of excitement in the news and in our world recently, hasn't there, right? That's not a surprise. That, that's always going on. But especially recently, I feel like there's a lot of things, especially from a Christian perspective, that could lead us to worry or to question or to struggle. And uh, Tim Chester in his um, commentary on Revelation had some great thoughts on this. And so I'm just going to actually read what he said here to help uh, get us ready for the study. So he said, turn on the television or open a newspaper. And what do you see? What matters in the world? Who matters in the world? What's important? Who has power? What are people living for? How do they make sense of the world? How would you describe what you see in the world? When John's readers turned on their metaphorical televisions and opened their first century equivalent of newspapers, this is what they saw. The power and pomp of the Roman Empire. Everywhere they looked, they saw symbols of Roman might. They saw the eagle standard carried by Roman soldiers and fixed over public buildings. The coins they held in their hands had images of the goddess Roma and the emperor. They saw grand buildings projecting the splendor of Rome. And in Asia Minor, where John's readers lived, the local elites welcomed the prosperity of the Pax Romana or Roman peace. And they also saw militarism. They saw soldiers from the all-conquering, rarely defeated Roman army. They feared invasions from Parthians in the east. They heard stories of war and slaughter, followed by famine and disease. If they had eyes to see, they might also see injustice and murder. They could enjoy the blood of gladiatorial combat, and they may have seen natural disasters and environmental catastrophes. So as they looked out on the world around them, this is the reality that they saw. These were the powers at play. And yet in Revelation 4, 1, what happens? John says, after this, I looked and before me was a door standing open in heaven. And what does he see? He sees the throne and rule of God. And so Revelation, all of Revelation, but especially 4.1 is, in, is inviting us to change our perspective, to see what's really going on behind the scenes, to see the unseen world ruling the seen world, and to live our life accordingly. And that's an exciting thing. So... Uh, and just to get our bearings before we even talk about the first couple of verses here, I, I think it's always helpful to see books as a whole. So if you remember, of course, chapter one was mostly the vision of Christ. And we talked about that, John's vision of Christ. And then we just finished chapters two and three, which were the letters. And now we're in the next part of Revelation, which really lasts from chapters four to five. This is a throne room scene that we're going to be looking at. And then after that, we'll get the series of seven seals and seven trumpets and seven bowls. So that will be coming and starting after the throne room scene. But this throne room scene really sets the scene, if you will, for the rest of the book. Uh, and there are, and let me just make a comment that there are a ton of connections here to Daniel 7 and Ezekiel 1 and the visions they had. So if you have time, I would highly encourage you at some point and you're interested to read Daniel 7 and Ezekiel 1 and just see the many, many connections that happen in this um, text. We could spend the whole time just talking about that. So let's look at the very beginning then, verse 1. After this, I looked and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. Yeah, and that's a, that's a really good insight, uh, Helen. That's great that you picked out even that small detail, which has meaning, the after this. Um, so after this, there's kind of two parts, I think, to this. Um, after this is a phrase that John uses throughout Revelation just to kind of tell us the sequence of visions he's having, right? So this is my vision, then after this, this vision happened, and after this, this vision happened. Um, but the ending, um, what must take place after this, a lot of people think that that's connecting back to verse 19 in chapter 1, which I think I have it written down here, so let me read that again. Revelation 119, write therefore the things that you have seen, chapter one, the things that are, a lot of people think chapter two to three, and then the things that will take place after this. Um, so while Revelation is a very fluid and hard to track book in general, and we shouldn't be too strict about, you know, assigning times to things when it's not clear, uh, a lot of people would say that this is kind of a textual key that a lot of what John's going to be talking about verse four and on is generally future things that he'll be he'll be discussing, if that makes sense. So that's that's a great insight. 
Oh, so it says the voice that he heard inviting him to come up is the first voice that he had heard, which also reminds us of chapter 1, verse 10. So this is probably the voice of Christ himself, a voice like a trumpet. And um, Helen had kind of helped us think about when this event is taking place. And a lot of people would generally say future. But just to, again, I want to keep you in, in, in view of the different views on some of these parts, because it will just be helpful understanding the book to know what different people think. So people will have different opinions about when in the future this is going to be. And so just a quick outline so you know the different uh, perspectives. The preterist position, if you remember that, thinks that this is very soon in the near future. This is first century stuff. So John is seeing stuff that was happening in the first century and really related to the first century. So it's, it's, it's future, but it's immediate future. The idealists might say that the visions that John is experiencing refer to the whole um, age of the, the whole church age rather than one specific time in the church age. And futurists would say that a lot of John's visions will focus on the final, any final tribulation period that might happen on the earth. But again, we can see in the visions that it's going to talk about some things in the past and stuff. So we, even if it's generally future, we shouldn't hold that category too tightly as we study it. Also, this would be a good point to quickly just mention the rapture. Since while Rev, there's nothing, uh, there's no super, super clear reference in Revelation to a rapture of the church. And sometimes people ask about that. But for those who do believe that the rapture is going to be separate from the second coming, which not everybody does. Um, a lot of people think that the rapture of the second coming will happen at the same time. Some people call that post-tribulational rapture. But for those who separate the two events, some people would see in chapter in chapter four, verse one, a possible reference to the rapture, which would be um, John's called up to heaven. The church potentially could be called up to heaven. There's uh, the reference to a trumpet. After chapter four, verse one, the word church doesn't reappear until chapter 22. So for those, it's again, it's not, a, it's not an extremely clear uh, reference, but for those who see those two events as being separate, some people would point to some of those, those details and say that maybe if Revelation is chronological, that the rapture would be happening around this time. So I thought some of you would be interested to know that. Uh, he says, in the spirit, which is the idea of um, a vision. That's a common phrase used about visions in scripture. And of course, we're seeing again, John taking the role of a prophet and visiting uh, God's heavenly council to hear what God has to say for us. So, okay. So that pretty much wraps up verse one. So let's jump into verse two then, where it's going to really start focusing on the key idea of these chapters, which is the throne. So at once I was in the spirit and behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. It's uh, the whole vision is mind blowing, isn't it? It, it, it is. It is. Uh, and as we discuss it, let's add in the next verse, a couple of verses here too. verse three. And he who sat on there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald and before the throne and I'm jumping to verse six and before the throne, there was as it were a sea of glass, like crystal, amazing, amazing images. Uh, in fact, one fun thing, I wish I had more time to do this um, is just to go online and, and, uh, you know, look up revelation images by chapter and just see like the art, the art history that people have done. And of course, um, you know, we don't know what exactly what these things look like, but like this, these, these words are just inviting us to picture the images going on, aren't they? They're just rich in detail. Um, Revelation is a picture book, <laughs> really, in the way it describes things, and it's meant to awe and overwhelm us. An interesting thing to point out as well is the importance of the word throne for all of Revelation, but these two chapters as well. The word throne occurs 17 times in chapters four and chapters five. Do you think that's significant? <laughs> Do you think that the throne is meant to have a prominent place? And then it occurs another 21 times in the rest of Revelation as well. Tim Chester says, uh, you know, a small comment, but very uh, significant, but very appropriate. What's um, one of the key ideas here? God is on the throne. And as we'll see in these chapters, everything revolves around this throne. 
And of course, for, for, for a people who are facing either temptation or persecution or difficulty, this is a very important and helpful reminder just that God is ultimately on the throne. That's a good reminder, Kathy. The center of Revelation, right, is the glory and majesty and worship of God, right? That's where everything else comes from. And that's good. That's good reminders. Okay, we are near the end of our time, so I'm just going to try and hit a couple quick points before we close. Isaac and I think Sheree made this note already, but it's good just to bear out that it's true that everything around the throne and God is described, and yet who's the one who's not described in any detail? God himself, right? And I'm sure that's intentional. God is beyond description. The prohibitions against idolatry and images of God were very strong throughout scripture, so I'm sure that's intentional. God and his glory is beyond description. There we go. And so it's describing the effects and the surround and the trappings of the glory, if you will, rather than God himself. Um, and of course, we have these precious jewels used to describe him. And, and of, of course, probably this is just uh, describing the wealth, the majesty, the beautiful color and, um, and light surrounding God's throne. Jasper is um, that could describe a lot of different things, but probably think almost a diamond, if you will, a, a crystal clear Carnelian is a red stone, so imagining beautiful red colors. Emerald, of course, is green, and we have an emerald green rainbow. That's an interesting description. That's interesting to imagine. The stones might be reminding us of later the splendor of the New Jerusalem, which has many of these stones built into it, or in the Old Testament, the high priest's breastplate. Uh, these are some connections we might be making here. Lightning and thunder, like Mount Sinai, when God reveals himself. The crystal sea, people go back and forth about what exactly this is. If you remember, though, of course, in the temple, and a lot of times when we look at images of heaven, they remind us of the temples made on earth because they are supposed to be pictures of the heavenly court. There, In Solomon's temple, there was a big bronze sea, which was a big washing basin in the courtyard. So maybe it's evoking that image, but it's also just this idea of something calm, clear as glass. It seems like people stand near it or on it at different points in the text. A couple of you mentioned just the, the idea of the open door and what, how encouraging that is. And Tom Wright in his commentary tells a little story. He says, when I was young and I thought about heaven and I thought of this idea of an open door to heaven, the picture in his mind was he would look out at the night sky and he'd see stars in the distance and he would imagine a little light opening up in the distance and then John being transported away into heaven, right? And you know, that, that's, a, that's a beautiful picture. But he said, now, as I've learned more and grown more, the image I have is not of a far distant away door opening, but of a door opening right before John in which he can step straight into the reality of heaven. And what's the difference there? Well, the difference, of course, is we often tend to think of heaven as this far away remote place. But the reality is that the presence of God, the rule of God is not far and distant. It's here. It's immediate. It's close. It's just beyond the veil. And that not only is it just beyond the veil, reality speaking, but it is just beyond the veil as God rules over this world. His rule is not far and distant. He is not far removed. He is here. He is in control, watching over his people. And this is great hope for us, isn't it? All right. So let's pray and get ready for service together. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this wonderful portion of scripture, which just makes us uh, in our imaginations and in our hearts sit around your throne. Behold the glory of who you are. Uh, behold your court, which is uncomparable. No, heavenly, uh, no earthly king or earthly monarch can compare to the glory of your splendor. Uh, no king or no government or no person can compare to the majesty and power of your rule. And thank you that though this world around us seems rocky and chaotic and going from evil to evil, yet you sit on your throne. You are unmoved and it is your power that is ultimately guiding the history of our world. And it is your power that is guiding and protecting and caring for your people. And you will see your glory lifted up, and you will see the end that you desire accomplished. And so we love you, and we thank you for that this morning. Bless our worship, bless the learning from your word later, and we ask these things in your precious name. Amen.